So um, we're very honored to have today with us in our Barilan University Vision Science Seminar, Professor Michael Bach from the University of Freiburg. Um, as you all know, Professor Bach is famous for his knowledge of and about visual illusions and for many years initiated and manages an amazing website about visual illusions. Now, since he asked me to cut this introduction short, I will um, say that he has an amazing um, um, expertise and knowledge um, about physics, optics, neurophysiology, um, neuroophthalmology, and many aspects about vision and the brain. So he was appointed a professor, um, and he has many appointments um, that I'm going to cut short. I will say um, that he took on many roles, um, and I will just mention a few. He was the president of the International Society for Clinical Electrophysiology of Vision, took on editorial roles in several scientific journals. He has authored 320 peer-reviewed papers, gave 120 oral presentations, wrote 20 book chapters and one book. His age index is 69. He has received 22 DFG grants to fund his research and supervised 64 student theses. And he is a member and has active editorial and scientific roles in multiple professional organizations. He also received multiple distinguished awards. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome you, Michael, to our seminar to hear about your exciting research. And thank you for joining us. And just one more thing, if I haven't mentioned, he's a professor in the University of Freiburg. So welcome. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Uh... And, and this was a short version, you say? Yes, okay. yes, much shorter. <laughs> ah, thank you for forcing it. And I see so many friends here. Thank you very much for coming. It's a, 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 an honor. So, uh, yes, indeed, and uh, no pressure, right? Um, why is my mouse not wrong? Okay, I will go to pairing. Um, it doesn't, ah, here's sharing. Finally, I have it. And there we are. And I'll start my presentation. Okay, perceptual illusions we understand well and illusions which aren't really illusions. And so uh, this is uh, the, uh, uh, these are the topics we will have to work through. And I'll start with these introductory reports. Um, for some reason, okay, there is this. So what is an illusion? One lame answer would be, I don't really know. That is true, but I know one, if I see one, yes, lame and not a uh, definition, which Gregory defined illusions as departures from reality. And the most important thing here is uh, that... Uh, he cl the, classifies it as an error in perception. So illusion is always associated that something is erroneous, and that will come up later. And uh, when it comes to understanding or explain, ex uh, explain an illusion, I think it should ideally be computationally, and there should be no lex illusiona, no special theory or any illusion. Rather, the explanation should arise as a natural byproduct of understanding vision. And uh, I'll start with uh, examples of true visual illusions, where I think we all would agree, even Brian Rogers. So this is the Lydic Chaser by Jeremy Hinton. That's actually how my web has started. Please follow the gap which runs around here in the circle. Uh, you see, there is a gap. If you follow this, you see there is just a gray gap. And now, alternatively, now look to the center, to the cross there, and let your gaze hang on the cross, and then you will notice a green ball running around. And if you are a good steady fixator, this green ball, ball will obliterate all these ugly magenta blobs. And if I advance now, you will suddenly see a circle of green blobs. Ah, so 
this is uh, well understood. Um, this is uh, the, these are the right chaser and small. And if you fixate on the center, that means that on if you here fixate, that means that on the background, on the fundus, which I now added as a background here, any part of the retina will always see this thing. And if you look a long time, what happens here? So it will see magenta, magenta, magenta. Then brief, it will see gray and magenta again, and then this cycles on. And what happens here is that we have adaptations take, taking place. So if it's always the same color, the ganglion cells, that's the side adapt. Then we have a brief uh, recovery. See, this goes slightly upwards, and then it uh, remains deep in adaptation because it adapts much longer than, than it is tested. This is sort of the test period. That's why we are so deep in color adaptation. That's why the effect is rather strong. And then it can visit this chromaticity space like this. Um, this is uh, gray. This is this magenta blob. So here is our, our uh, two possible stimuli. And when we when the retina gets only magenta for a long time, we get a shift in the color space. <clears throat> so that will become not magenta anymore. As you see, they go away and rather the gray now appears as green. So this is part of color rotation or color constancy. And this is fairly well understood. We know that it starts in the retinal ganglion cells. Okay, this is it. It fixates the cross, and this is a green ball. Um, someone says something. So, in principle, I would like questions during the talk, but this doesn't work well online, unfortunately. Yes, uh, and I don't have the time to look at comments. Uh, so, but if there's anything important, please simply interrupt me. Right. That was a light exchange, and now let's move on to the rotating snakes. Note to self, speak slowly. I oh, always forget that. So this is the um, rotating snakes illusion, made famous by Akiyoshi Kitaoka. And I do hope that you see rotating all over the screen if you move your eyes, and if it's weak, Increase your brightness that becomes stronger with a brighter display. Here's an alternative for me that makes jerky movements. And always, when I perform a saccade, the there's the jerk of this wheel. Not everyone sees this surprisingly, but you already notice saccades are important. If we fixate steadily, there is no seeming motion. It also uh, works in. Uh, without color and black and white. I'm not sure if it works for you if you look around. There are two papers on this. The first paper says there is the same effect strength. The more recent one says there is a lower effect strength with black and white. Yes, um, I think it's a little lower. But black and white is easier to analyze because here you can see the four-step asymmetric luminance sequence. So uh, any of these wheels has a black part then next to it, a light gray, then comes white, then comes a dark gray, and then black again. So that's asymmetric, light gray and dark gray around the black or white, respectively. And uh, and the illusion strength depends, of course, on these luminous levels of the two intermediate gray patches, and we measure that. This is exactly what our participants in the experiment saw. They had the cards between these two spots of so the cross jumped around and you followed it as so that those were trained the cards and we had here many of these discs and these are all non-illusion discs because they are symmetrical so there's black and gray the dark gray is on both sides of the black then comes uh the light gray white and the light gray is also symmetric with respect <coughs> to white and these don't rotate at all. But there's one disk, namely this one, that has the asymmetric sequence, so light gray, black, dark gray, white. That rotates, I'm not sure if it rotates for you well, if you make the cards between these spots, but our participants saw it moving, and to measure the illusion strengths, we let this disk move physically in opposite direction to the perceived motion. So. If you see motion now, you write this really moves. Yeah? 
And so and our participants had this uh, knob which you could turn and they adjusted the knob to null to null out uh, the motion. And uh, the physical motion that nulled the motion was a measure of illusion strength. I even got got Anstis to agree that it moves here. And uh, to quantify this further, let's have a little nomenclature. So this is half of the disk, and here we have white. And one gray level, this is a little dark here, so this would be G1, black, and another gray level, G2. And this doesn't need to be in this configuration, so let's simply unroll it. And now we have this sequence in that direction. We have these two gray levels, and in between white and black. And uh, now we, we, since we have two, excuse me, and since we have two, Luminous level, you can plot this in a two-dimensional space. So here is the one luminous level, G1, there is G2. This is an extreme black, black, white, black. And here is another extreme. And for instance, uh, if, a, if we had the luminous level here, it would make the disk look like that. Up there, it would make it look like that. So and now we plot our results. We had 19 participants, uh, many trials, and they are averaged here. The scales indicates in red, uh, seeming motion in the usual illusion direction, and that's opposite motion. And indeed, we find, as expected, in the very luminous range here, which is about this one, where Akiyoshi placed his uh, rotating snakes illusion, there is the highest illusion strength, nearly one degree per second. Unexpectedly, there's another uh, so, uh, opposite motion illusion island up here, which markedly less illusion strength, but they do, uh, all our participants, and even I, after a while, saw there is opposite motion with this special uh, arrangement of uh, these two gray levels. And uh, that was uh, published, of course, and I see that as a litmus test for models. <coughs> ah. uh, because there are four models out there to explain the rotating snakes illusion, these four and three of them do not predict an opposite rotation island. Bacchus and Org do, but there are some other problems with it. Paper, <laughs> at least I think. I, you know what? I'll just no. I'll first show you something. No, I'll show you these these results, and I grab a uh, something to drink. Always good to have a little break in the talk. Um, Okay, the litmus test is, and, and now I have, of course, another model, which I think is easier. Um, and to explain that, I have briefly to make it due to, to motion perception. So many of you will know this, of course, um, not everyone possibly, so let me please go through this. If you were a fly and you ask yourself, yourself has this lizard moved from there to there and it's going to catch you, these two images are very similar. So it's difficult to know if it has moved. So let's put these two images into your motion receptors, which in humans, by the way, are in the brain, not in the retina. And uh, so uh, uh, now the fly also looks at it with its motion detectors. And there you see, if we just show these two images briefly, after one after another, at the same place, there is seeming motion, which is the basic of all our cinema and TV stuff and so on. So this is apparent movement. And these motion detectors, um, the one version is by Reichardt. This is his uh, original paper on motion detectors. And here it's a, uh, the version, it's basically the same version, just differently arranged. And that is the two-legged 
correlation type motion detector, which I'll explain in a second. And if you are more used to the motion energy detectors, no problem. Um, Adels and Bergen have shown that, that the motion energy detectors and the correlation detector are mathematically isomorphic. <laughs> so they explain the very same thing. So you would have sort of um, um, affected me, <laughs> it seems. Okay, how does such a motion detector work? Here is an object that moves, and when it passes this receptor, the receptor output goes to a multiplier over here, and also to a delay stage. Here's nothing, there's nothing, so these two, <laughs> zero. If this then moves over there, then we have um, the direct connection here and the delay at the same time outputs a signal to this multiplier. And we have something times something, so we have an output. And since this goes to the positive input of this differential amplifier, we get a positive output. For motion in the opposite direction, I don't go to the into the entire rigmarole. Anyway, it will there will be the output, and since this is the negative input, it will give a negative signal output. Okay, so the output polarity indicates motion direction. Also, the balance between these two inputs adapts, and that it gives motion after effect. Let's try it briefly. I'm sure you all know it. Fixate the cross. Keep on fixating. When the Buddha comes up next time, the Buddha will expand. That's the motion after effect, which, by the way, people often explain by a fatigue, which is totally not the case. It's a gain control, it's an active gain control mechanism, which then has shifted due to adaptation. Okay, now. Let's take these motion detectors and let's look, let's look them, let's have them look at an unrolled snake. So this is an unrolled snake, which we have seen earlier, black, dark gray, white, light gray. And um, here I have this random shift thing, which means that the eye movements have position uh, different parts of unrolled snakes always um, on these motion detectors, so they see a different picture at any given saccade. And then one simply calculates what happens with these motion detectors when they see these gray levels. And then we simply add them up, um, make a sum of them, and the output is zero. Hmm. That was um, disappointing. Then I that well never is the entire is the motion system linear. <laughs> of course, here we have a non-linearity, but everything else is linear here. But usually everything is saturates a little bit in if you look at nervous, nervous transmission. So we let's just introduce a little bit of saturating a non-linearity here. Any anyone could be square root or any works, even. Uh, even if you rect a rectifier. Uh, no, um, no, not a rectifier. Ah, never mind. It, it has to be a zero symmetric. So a rectifier wouldn't work. So after this situation, let's sum it again. And this is the model output. Again, plotted in this luminance space of one gray level and the other gray level here, these two gray levels. So this is the model output without any three parameters, I just adjust the size to fit the unrolled snake. And if we compare this to the private experiment, which we saw briefly, we see some, uh, uh, some we see it sort of fits. And uh, this is of course also published. And this model successfully predicts when you fixate steadily, there is no motion illusion unless you do a pattern appearance. That works. I haven't shown you that, but that uh, that works, and this is also pre predicted here. With real world cards across or near the pattern, it explains that the maximum illusion is there, 
where they are also found psychophysically, and it also predicts an opposite illusion islands. One of one of things it doesn't produce correctly, this would have the same strengths than uh, the standard position, which differs from our psychophysical findings. And it just assumes standard motion detectors and any nonlinearity. So this fits how I would like it. It's computational. And I don't need any special law just to play, explain this illusion. So finally, we're I done. Can, so, can yes, I, can yes, I ask I, something about it? Oh, yes, please um, go ahead. So um, in your experiment, when you try to explain it, the saccade... Uh, the saccades were a fixed distance, and I also assumed they had a fixed viewing distance. So I wonder. Ah. Yeah. Okay, yes, you on. understand my question already. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. So. Uh, okay. Um, the output I showed, which I forgot to mention, is averaged over all possible phases. Mm. The one thing is that mm. it, that I sort of assume that the that the sequence white, G1, black, and so on, fits a distance of motion receptors. Yeah, But because we have many of them, and they are mm -hmm. all arranged in different distances, there is always some which fits uh, what we are just looking at. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. So, uh, so it, yeah. Okay, interesting. Yes. Yeah, okay. So I just wanted to, to understand if you would have... Uh... As for uh, the participants to make bigger saccades, the smaller saccades, would you get the same or would it scale? Uh, but I understand that because the snake itself is scalable. Um... Yes, and and also there are of course position where where everything nulls out, but there are neighboring motion detectors. They all overlap. Yeah, that they where where they fit. So either they have a zero output. Or they have the output in the more in the in the uh, in the illusion direction, so mm -hmm. they don't cancel. Then they never give an output in the opposite direction if they are just misarranged. Uh, so um, yes, uh, and thank you for asking this because I forgot to mention that this averages over all possible phases between the motion detector and the stimulus. Thank right. You. Any more questions? Not at this time. So let's go on to this part of the talk. Illusions, which aren't really illusions. Okay, so first let me please introduce um, terminology, optic space versus image space, which also we call distal versus proximal and old uh, well-defined terminology. So uh, this root here is object space. And this is a projective. We see here wonderful how do I uh showed how this could be done. Uh, this object space uh, is then uh, projected into an image space. You, you move this frame around and then uh, notice where uh, is where this uh, line uh, would go through the empty frame. Then you remove the line and, and fold it back and then you make the blot. So this is how the loot is projected. In fact, there is a well-known image uh, the ambassadors where one of these foreshortened loots is well depicted. Okay, so we have here object space and image space. And uh, uh, this projection takes place in the eye, of course. And then the image of the eye goes to the brain and the brain has sort of in perception go the opposite way to go to an object space, which now is no longer an object space, but a virtual object space, which I make a little clearer in this. Um, uh, from the outer to the inner world image, so we have a uh, object space out there or a scene, and then you have a projection here that's image space, and this goes up the brain. We lose some information on the way, and then the brain has the problem, how do I reconstruct something uh, a, a virtual object space that represents something like this, so we can uh, we can uh, act in it. And uh, this is this inverse problem, of course, not solved in generally. This is clear. This is just physics. The entire thing is coupled by experience. And then comes space along, which I will not go into the depths. I make it very intuitive. So uh, the version of his formula is like this. The probability 
that an object exists in the world. So that's what's, what's operating. This is calculated here. This problem, object given the image which comes up. And this probability is proportional to the product of two other probabilities. One is the probability that an object simply exists. Had I seen this before and is it somehow stored uh, that this object exists? And then uh, the probability that this image which travels up would uh, be caused if that object exists in the world. Okay, so uh, now let's make a, a, a more clear example. These are images by then cast, by the way. So if on the retina we have these arrangements of lines, which immediately we see not just as parallel ones, but we see a little cube or something, because a cube would make, cause this projection. <clears throat> this travels up the brain. The brain says, ah, yeah, yeah, I know. This is typical. Um, let me see here. Yeah, the screen is... Uh... Now let's back again, yeah, right? Yeah. Yes. Ah, uh, excellent. So the brain thinks, ah, oh, yeah, I know. If, uh, if this comes up, then there's a cube out there in the world, which is uh, a good assumption. There's a high probability that this is called this here is caused by a cube. And of course, one doesn't realize that there could be other objects which happen to have the same projection. They sort of cannot be seen as soon as they rotate. You see them, but if they're static, you would never predict from this image, that object in the world. Okay, to make it even more intuitive, my question would be, what do you see here? Now, we can't do this live, unfortunately, but typically, typically people say a hand. Yes, I would also say a hand, but we, that already has many steps behind it, if you say a hand, because actually here, there are dark pixels, there are yellowish pixels, right? So it starts, we have a pixelated image. Second, if a hand is... Whatever it is, it's the shadow of a hand. Yeah, if we interpret these pixels as, um, as something on the projection plane, we would say, aha, a shadow of a hand. And uh, that's indeed very likely. And it's because it is very rare in life that a rabbit would make uh, such movements that it looks like a, hand, uh, a shadow hand. Yeah, this wonderful image I have from Roberto Corsati. So, because very rarely, or actually never, right, in life, a rabbit does these antics, we would uh, uh, interpret this hand as this shadow as a rabbit rather than a hand. Okay, okay, now we are, that was a side way to. Uh, what I mean when I, uh, when I look at this perception path here, and we still have object space and image space, and now apply, let's apply this to Shepard's tables. And uh, turning the tables, that's what Robert called it, and let me go to a demonstration here. Let's make a okay, the question that is usually asked, does this table clause here? Ah, no, no, I can't move it. Can, does this table clause, let's call it a table clause, fit on the other table? And of course, you would say no. And then one said, ah, look here. And uh, there. And it fits. Or can do this automatically, then it fits even easier. And then say, oh, that's an illusion. Uh, the table looks uh, look very different, but in reality, they are the same. And this is what people usually say here. But what is really happening? The question, are these table surfaces identical, is sort of implicitly in object space. Yeah, Because you're thinking of a table in real life. And then you manipulate an image space. Yeah, that's cheeky. I mean, this is really sort of bluffing. You, you, uh, you get the your the the one you are talking to, your subject. Let's say, so think about object space, and then you suddenly manipulate stuff in image space, and then of course, unlikely things can occur. Here is, by the way, a picture of Robert when he had an exhibition in Paris. You also see his little monsters there that we can also show them. Let's 
try them out. Uh, there. Okay. A little larger. So if you take this monster and move them here, then this is appears more than that. Again, we do a manipulation in image space. And then we say, ah, look, this is smaller. Yeah, but of course, because we change stuff in image space. And if in reality, we would have a second monster here and move this forward, then of course it would not uh, appear smaller because it would in fact get larger because of projection on the retina is changing. Okay, so again, uh, we have made a manipulation in image in image space, and then the question implicitly shifts, no, explicitly shifts to object space. That's cheeky. It's not an illusion. There's nothing wrong here. What is wrong is just the question which puts you into the inappropriate mode, namely into object mode, when then suddenly people change stuff in image mode. Same applies to Ted Nielsen's wonderful checkerboard. So people usually they ask here, you see two squares, A and B, which is brighter. And I would say square A is brighter. And then uh, the people who call this an illusion, they change the context and then suddenly you see they have the same gray level. Yeah, or you can also put this way. If you move the square over there, you see they are identical. And it appears darker. You can shift that. And everything I'm doing here is being done in image space. And no wonder if I shift to things in image space, that doesn't apply to object space. So again, we don't have an illusion here. If you say this, uh, this is brighter than that, you are perfectly correct if you apply it to object space. Um, because in reality, this really would be uh, lighter. It's a lighter material than that, but because the shadow is there of the column, the light is somewhere over there. It was arranged by Ted, of course, to have the same gray level than that one. Again, I would say, uh, it's not a illusion, it's just a question which confounds image space and object space. And a final example, always the same story. You know this probably, uh, the lot of Perth's color cube. And the question is, are these two similar? And you say, no, no, it sets the light orange, that's a dark orange, and then context is changed. And haha, they are the same brown. Okay. And here, what is written, I found this on some websites. Uh, uh, they say, the colored tiles it tricks you into thinking. Tricks you, yeah? The square on top is brown, whereas the square on the side is orange. And then now comes the, in reality, both squares are the same color. In reality, so which reality? The screen reality? or the physical space which the screen image depicts. Again, the question confounds object space and image space. In fact, we have sort of two very radical realities, namely object space, where this color of cube would really sit on a table, and image space, which is also very radical, and we can't mix them. Uh, by the way, this is, of course, also a wonderful example of color constancy. So, just to, again, if we mix object space and image space, we can make theming illusions. And I'm at my summary. Richard Gregory defines them as departures from reality, so implies an error. Okay. Yes. And in the examples I showed you, there exists both an object space and an image space. In the latter, we manipulate stuff. Both these spaces are real, and perception is very radical in both, but there is no error if we combine the two, unless you ask a quirky question. <laughs> this is it. The question confounds these two, seemingly revealing the illusion. Both are wonderful phenomena, doing stuff like color constancy or projection. No, no, those are no errors. There is no illusion. Those are just trick or three questions and this uh, 
does not apply to entire vast richness of illusions. There are many that are different, but there are some where it's just a trick question, and that's why I say these aren't really illusions. Brian Rogers also was raised a similar point, and the yarn too. So I'm done with my talk. Thank you very much for thinking along. I think I stopped sharing. So uh, I want to ask everybody to unmute yourself and uh, let's give uh, Michael a big applaud for a really great and interesting talk. And I'm actually sure there are questions. I myself have a few, but um, I don't have to go first. So uh, <laughs> wait, are you up to taking questions? Or... Absolutely. I was just coughing without the sound off. And I apologize for coughing all over the place. As there were no, nothing, no viruses transmitted, I swear it. But the no, sound, I, of yeah, course, yeah, was obnoxious. Thought, is it really, could it really go through the Zoom? Uh, but yeah, I hope not. Uh, okay, joking. Um, so I want to ask, I mean, ending at the, the, like the last point that you made about many of the so-called illusions that we pers we think are illusions are basically tricking us in image space while actually in object space we are not we are not illusions or whatever so i want to ask do we ever perceive image space at all i mean because it seems that our perception i mean according to what you're saying it's like we cannot we cannot perceive image space. We always translate it to, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, you could think about binocular rivalry and sometimes we swap the perception, but I'm thinking, don't we usually uh, try to, to embed it in real world? I, I don't yeah, know, maybe that's philosophical. That's, that's difficult. Yeah, an answer <laughs> that is not a good answer to the question. If, if you think of the Prokinia, images of the vessels in your eye yeah yeah there you are actually perceiving image space yeah you're perceiving really the retina but this is not this is not what you are referring to i think in the and, and anyway you pro project that perkinji uh tree into the world and you see it on the wall and and you will change the size of the apparent uh tree with the function with your viewing distance so i think it's not even an example there oh heck oh my i think it's jeremy who's talking there right yes yes definitely jeremy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, ah, definitely. there you are yes 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 <laughs> i heard your voice yeah yes you i i agree so uh well if you're that clever jeremy <laughs> You're all right. clever. Um, yes. do can you think of an example as answer to sharon's question that uh, sounds like a Patrick question to me, but uh, uh, yeah, Patrick, of course. Uh, I know I agree with you, Sharon. That you you cannot turn off the uh, three dimensional interpretations of uh, anything presented on a flat surface. Um, of course, if you make it just sort of some random dots, then there is no three dimensional. So then, yeah. then you appreciate its flatness perhaps more. But even when you do see it as a three dimensional image you also know that it's flat so there's a bit of a interesting puzzle there yeah as an aside i i wonder if it was always like that i mean we of course grow up with tvs yeah but the thing in the stone age times where people never had the situation where something flat was the projection of something 3d so i'm not i, I wonder whether this uh well, three it is automatic 3D is, is is learned. There's lots of uh, uh, well, that's that's a question that um, John Kennedy addressed: whether understanding 3D and images is learned or um, innate, built in. And he he claims it's built in. Uh, the, it's, it's not learned, and and certainly the Stone Age people had lots of um, wall art, cave art, uh, and the yeah. idea is. Not that they invented. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what what about shadows? Exactly. If you have a I was shadow of a hand against a wall. Yeah. Are you seeing that in a image space? Are you seeing that in, in the 3D space? Good question. Um, if, you know the rotating there. dancer? Yeah, so yeah. she's yeah. a shadow and it's I don't know. I mean maybe that's oh, yeah, she she can be a shadow, yes, yes. 
Yes, the silhouette. I think if there's an object that owns the shadow, you might be more inclined to see it as flat. But if if there's no apparent object like the rabbit that Michael you showed, uh, yeah. then the shadow <clears throat> could be taken as a form. I think the rotating dancer, it's not a thing of shadow, but it's rather a question of silhouette. Silhouette have always two interpretations. It yeah. can be this way or that way. And the rotating dancer is is the silhouette effect because while it rotates you invert front and back, and that's why it seems to reverse direction. Uh, but it's, it's, are... it's also, um, uh, it resembles when you see somebody far away and there's not enough light. Sometimes you don't know if they're walking towards you or away from yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's that's like, a silhouette situation. Like a yeah. personality test, yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I don't. Know. Um, but I mean, pets. That was a joke, wasn't it? Or is it really used as a personality test? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it is. Perhaps I mean, the the, the internet is full of of people who say if you see this or that, then you are interested in sex or not. Or I mean, it's amazing. I don't know. Yes. Yeah, Patrick. Very, very nice, Michael. Um, uh, I'm always amazed by all of the beautiful work you put into your website, uh, and it's a yes, pleasure. Yes, absolutely. Here you talk about some of the items there. Uh, I did have one question about the your model of the um, the um, uh, snakes illusion with the nonlinearity. Uh, what kind of duration does your model predict for the duration of motion seen in the image? Oh. Oh. There, there, there is no time in that model, so it does not predict any duration. But of course, if you look into this motion detector mm. that always has finite uh, sequence uh, uh, stages um, in time, and uh, so um, when a motion detector is triggered, it gives out a signal because the multiplier gives an output and that, that it has a sort of low pass action as everything there. And this low pass would make a time prediction. But um, so when one would know about the, the, the low pass uh, properties um, of the motion detectors, then one could actually make a time prediction. As it is, uh, you are perfectly right that the time aspect is not covered by that model. Okay. I would, George Mather just did a nice study with um, uh, pupil dilation. So every eye movement and blink or onset creates a temporary constriction and dilation. And those dilations uh, correlate with the illusion. So his idea was that the shrinking uh, uh, changes the luminance so that they just take the image and make a luminance modulation and you do get motion perhaps by the mechanisms yeah in fact that, that that would be could would be a form of pattern onset or the pattern on off it's just yeah. not fully on off but just a modulation if you modulate That's the pattern the in contrast uh, it also uh, gives a motion illusion so so the pupil would constriction could be seen as a modulation yeah, it modulates and it has about the same time constant that people report in other words a interesting <laughs> Mm -hmm. Thank you. You might try your model on this gradual change in luminance. Yeah. Uh, I've already noted John Kennedy. So who, who wrote it? Who John that Kennedy has a, beautiful, has a beautiful book called um, The uh, Picture Something of Pictures. From yeah, but now the other name you just mentioned about the oh, George Mather. George Mather. Ah, ah, oh, yes, of course. I know him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I look it up. Thank you. Ah, uh, yeah. Michael, uh, Zelly, I just want to mention you. You mentioned the low pass filter in the model, but uh, we, we published Miguel Angel Garcia Perez and I a study in um, in OSA or JOSA A that showed that all kind of motions where the question is binary, where it went left or right, uh, could be determined simply in a model that determine the low pass filtering. So the low pass filtering is sufficient to solve this uh, 
uh, limited problem of whether it went left or right in, oh, in terms really? of motion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it, and, the title and, is computer. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I, I, and, and would that also fall for Blicker? Because that's why flicker. you need the two-legged motion detector, yeah? Uh, otherwise, the motion detector responds to flicker erroneously. Yeah. So And you, what yeah, happens so, with your low-pass model if you have flicker? I mean, slow enough flicker? If if there's flicker, there's no... Even in the experiments, there are situations where you see flicker and not the motion. So the, this this specifically ans have to answer the question, is the motion was right or left? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so okay. you're, uh, yeah, the, you're, you're not quite asking the question. So, asking the question as you've nicely presented here is really uh, the intervention that affects <laughs> the result. And so, if if the question is whether it's moved right or left, all you need to answer that is low pass filter, which okay, I look at that. Thank yeah, it's a thank just, you. Uh, Start, the title starts with imputation, so that's okay, fair enough. Answers. Okay, thank you, Eli. Um, so, I mean, I do have more questions, but I think maybe I'll just write to you in the email <laughs> so I don't... Uh, um, so I want to uh, thank you, Michael, again for joining us. It was a really nice and exciting talk, something that we can all connect to. Uh, and yeah, uh, so really thanks a lot for joining us and for the great talk. And um, next week we will have here uh, Professor um, Alan Kingston um, mm -hmm. from UBC. So yeah, um, I hope um, you will also join us uh, then. And um, thanks, everybody. Um, for coming. Thank you. Thank, wow. you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Thank for very listening much. and your thoughtful questions. <laughs> okay. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.